All right, so we are all set to get started. It is officially 5.30. Welcome, everyone. How is everyone doing today? Good, awesome. Everyone find the location okay? Anybody get lost on the way here? Got lost? No? <laughs> well, hopefully not. Hopefully everybody was able to find. Going on the different ways. Going east, west, and right, yeah. <laughs> well, so welcome, everyone. Again, we're going to go ahead and officially get started. Um, again, for the record, my name is Bolivar Gomez, officially your host for City University. Um, welcome to session number four. Um, just by a quick show of hands, has anyone actually been to the Mid Florida Event Center previously? Has anyone by a show of hands? Really? All, most of you guys have been here. That's great. We actually also had an international festival, I believe, last weekend. By a show of hands, did anybody come to that event? I see. Did you? Oh, that's awesome. I heard it was a good turnout, but um, I think it might be uh, a reoccurring thing, so definitely look out for that uh, next year, too. So. I believe that will be a, a reoccurring event for, for the city, so I'm glad that you guys at least heard about it. So for today, we are going to go ahead and start off with a special presentation. We actually have our uh, event center director, Mr. Brandon McAllister, that is here with us today. And he's going to talk a little bit about the, the facility that you all are in right now, as well as some of the programs and activities that the event center also hosts. And then even on the um, other side of the wing, there it is the recreation side, too. So we will get into a little bit of that as well. So. With that, we're going to go ahead and officially get started. I mentioned that, that we do have some water and soda in the back. So if anyone would like to get some, some drinks beforehand, you guys are more than welcome to do so. So on that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, Brandon to talk a little bit about the Mid-Florida Event Center. Welcome, Brandon. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Event Center. If you haven't been there, welcome for your first time. <laughs> if only I had a nickel, right? Um, so we're the Mid Florida Credit Union Event Center and we are your event destination in Port St. Lucie in my opinion, right? Um, so we put, I put together a little presentation and I'll uh, follow along. I hope everyone enjoys it. So here we go. Technical difficulties. So we'll take you on a little trip here through the through the center. This is as you're as you're walking in. And here the lobby where you guys hopefully recognize that where you first came in. We have over 6,400 square feet, which is also you didn't see a shot, but is the home of the Florida Sports Hall of Fame also. And that's the recreation entrance. Um, for anybody that is a member of the Health and Fitness Center. And then here we're going to turn into the one of my favorite spots, the Art Gallery. We host several, um, several different artists, and even the St. Lucie Arts Alliance does exhibits here. Um, so keep an eye on the calendar. If you're art, art lovers, come check it out. We have a lot of great, great displays. And um, and then here's where you are, part of it anyways, is the Emerald Ballroom. And we host many, many different kinds of events in this room. Um, one day it could be a banquet, as you see here. Could be a trade show. It could be um, a dance dance show. It is a multiple. It's a multi multi-purpose, flexible, flexible space. We even do. We even even done concerts in here um, for about a thousand people. So, not sure if anybody was an Eagles fan. We've done some Eagles shows here. Not. Eagles tributes. As we come here, we'll go. It's going across the hallway to our our Ruby Ballroom, which is a smaller a smaller subdividable room just like this. And we'll do your smaller banquets. Um, smaller receptions, we do um, like 
kindergarten graduations in there when is, during graduation season. Um, even wrestling, I've seen them cram wrestling in here with a ring and uh, about 400 seats. So that's kind of a you know a little little overview of um, of the facility. And we are the event center is um, a local and regional special event center of of Port St. Lucie. And we you know we host events here and outside as a quality of like a quality of life for the citizens of Port St. Lucie. And we hope you guys are hope you guys enjoy it and hopefully come come some more. And we have five we have five primary business lines here is your vent operations, your facility services, sales and marketing, food and beverage and finance. So event operations, these are kind of this is like kind of the front one of the front front what's the right word? Front front facing people that you'll see. So if you come if you come to the event center and you're like, I would like to have my wedding here. I would like to um, have a dan dance competition here. These are the folks that will help you in planning your event. They will help you with your event coordination. They do your, you know, help you with your production. Do I need, do I need a sound system? Do I need two microphones? Do I need four microphones, right? Um, they help coordinate with um, catering if you wanted food and beverage at your event or if you're doing a dance recital, maybe you want a concession stand, that kind of thing. And they're, um, they help you with your event staffing. And same way if you were doing a, uh, like the Port St. Lucie Home Show that's coming up. They'll help you lay out your room, set your booths up, um, and everything you need in your booths from um, electricity, tables, chairs, that kind of thing. And then we do, you have your facility services, and these are the guys that take care of the facility, they set up the facility, they put, put all the equipment away in the facility, and so they do maintenance, they help us um, find capital projects that need to be done around the facility, they work on repairs, they do cu custodial and ground, ground services here at the building, they monitor their life safety, um, surveillance systems, um, facility and perimeter security, building access, equipment safety. And then we have our sales, sales and marketing team. And so they're the ones that, you know, take your money, right? And the other half promotes you coming here and letting us have your money. So they, you know, they solicit client, the salesperson will solicit clients, um, send out bid proposals. They'll come, um, if you want to do, you want to come look at the room, they're the ones who will take you around the room and say, oh, this is, you can fit however many tables in here. Um, and then our marketing, um, our marketing arm, they take care of all of our, uh, in conjunctions with the city's communications department, but um, website, social media, um, they go to, you know, if we have a booth at a trade show, they'll go there and man the trade show booth to inform other people about everything great going on at the Mid Florida Event Center. Um, food and beverage services, we have a great um, exclusive caterer, creative catering, and they could they provide all of your catering for events and um, concessions for events and even outside concessions for our, some of our outdoor events. Um, they take care of all the, the, so the facility behind that wall, there's a kitchen, a full kitchen. So they, they're responsible for the, taking care of the kitchen facilities and equipment. Um, they supervise and manage the food service operation during, during before, during, and after an event. Um, we work together to maximize revenues with them, with the uh, catering service and they create and prepare menus and special um, presentations. So finance, they, they make sure we pay our bills and get our money, right? <laughs> um, they also uh, manage the box office and capital expenditures and budget plans and supply, supply administrative support. 
to all of us in the office. Um, so, interesting fact, this year, you know, our, our goal is to strengthen government and enhance community engagement. This year, believe it or not, we, the, as the moment I updated this, in 2022, 2021-2022, we had, we hosted 320 event days. And as of just a few days ago, with what we had in September, we hosted 400 event days in 2022 and 2023. Um, pop quiz, how many days are in a year? <laughs> right, so as you can see, um, we're, we're doing multiple, that means we're doing multiple events in one day. And that is a huge, you know, quite a, a large increase. That's 80 more events basically than last year alone. Um, the, you know, obviously the building, if you've ever been here, is used for educational and training opportunities um, for the citizens, like if you've been to the Hurricane Expo. Anybody Hurricane Expo? Okay. Okay. So that's a, that's a good one. If anybody's new to Port St. Lucie, that's a good one to come to. Got a lot of great information and a lot of great vendors. Um, local companies and community groups come here to have meetings, market products. Um, we are, we do act as a town hall for the city. And uh, in the video you saw, we are the home to the 2,000 square foot art gallery and it offers local and regional artists a professional venue to advance and display their work. And again, as I said, a big, a big thing is we are the home of the Florida Sports Hall of Fame. If you haven't been there, uh, take a moment tonight on your way out Take us, maybe I can open it up and you guys can take a spin through there. So the exciting part, upcoming events. Is anybody excited? No? No? Okay, so I, I do have a small video. Maybe it'll get your blood pumping a little bit. Anybody, anybody know Soul Asylum, Sister Hazel? All right. <laughs> so we do. We have a lot of great, great events, and this is just a, you know, just a small, just a small section of what we got coming up this year. Um, we'll have the Port St. Lucie um, Fall Festival and Bacon and Barbecue Festival. Anybody like bacon? Yeah. Okay. Well, this might be the event for you. Um, as you. As, as you saw, we have um, PSL and Lights. We're doing a, a Forever Motown holiday celebration. So if you come to the Festival of Lights, there'll be a, a, a concert attached with that. Um, we have Sister Hazel coming up November 18th, as you just saw. Um, we're working on, we got Clay Walker and Casey Tyndall for the country fans out there. Any country fans? All right. Um, and then we're also hosting the Pop 2000 tour, which is hosted by Chris Kirkpatrick, Vincent, um, O Town, Ryan Cabrera, and LFO. Um, we have one more coming soon, big to be announced um, rock concert. We're trying to put the final touches on that and get it finalized, and we'll be, you know, letting everybody know as soon as we can. And, you know, one of our missions is we try to diversify. We're trying to diversify our lineup and give everybody um, something to see here. You know, um, a lot of the citizens, they ask for rock. They ask for country. But we're trying something special here with Jose Alberto. Salsa. Anybody salsa? This might be for you. Might be for you. Um, and, of course, we do the July 4th Ultimate Experience. Has anybody attended that? Very good. If you haven't, buy your tickets. You get to come inside. It's air conditioned. You get one free drink. And then all you can eat buffet. And 
prime fireworks viewing spot out here on the deck. So if you haven't been, tickets sell pretty fast for it, right? So if, when you're ready, when they're on sale, make sure you get yours because you can still go in and out. You don't have to stay in at the uh, experience all day, but it gives you definitely gives you a spot to come in and cool off. So a um, couple other things we got going on in the live performing arts area. We got art exhibitions going on um, all year long and a very cool group, the Ambassadors of Swing, if anybody likes swing music. And they got three, three more dates coming up, um, in, one in 2023 and two more in 2024. Um, if you like, if you like swing. This is how you can connect with us on social media or via our website um, with our calendar events or you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll, we'll get everything to your inbox for you. And then, any questions? Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. I just want to, you know, really commend your team, too, with uh, the amount of work that you guys do here and with the, the events that you guys host. It's a lot of work. I know I've worked closely with you and, and other people uh, that work here at the event center. And actually, we are going to be having our um, graduation dinner at this exact location here at the event center. So that'll be uh, towards the beginning of November. So we will be back for that um, as well. And so, you know, like I said, um, I've worked with you closely on, you know, other events, like we've had um, outdoor movie nights, you know, here previously on the lawn, and as well as other events inside. So definitely encourage everyone here to, to come back for some of these events. Um, certainly, if you know of someone that might be hosting an event of some sort, you know, um, you can always refer them to, to our team here, and we can certainly get you in contact with the right people to help plan for that event. But um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and open up the, the mic here, and I, I do see one hand in a raise. And repeat the question one more time here. What's the minimum size of occupants in some of these rooms if you want to reserve them? So, if, so for instance, um, like in, in here, so where you see all these beams running across the ceiling, we can divide this in. We can divide this into three separate rooms instead of one room. And so, if we close the wall, both the walls, and you're in between both of the walls. You could fit probably roughly 75 people in here, depending on what kind of setup you're doing. If it's just uh, what we call a theater setup, where it's just chairs next to each other, or you know, with a table set up like that, it would be a little bit. Every time you add something, it takes away space, right? So you add tables, your your capacity goes down. If you do round tables like for a dinner function, it would go down. You could probably get um, about 60. Five people at round tables. If you were just in, you could close the walls up and just the room you're in. And in, in Ruby, we do the Ruby kind of divides up into even smaller rooms where you can have like a board meeting for 12 to 15 people at tables. Good, good question. I, I think he actually has one follow up question. Hold on one second. Can you have food provided? Yes, you can. So uh, you can use our exclusive caterer, creative catering. They can cater your event. You know, the, they'll work with you to plan a menu if you, you, know, if you want hors d'oeuvres, if you just want heavier d'oeuvres, or you want a dinner, they can work with you um, to plan the catering for your event. Or there are um, approved vendors, city approved outside vendors that you can also Good question. I know Kathleen had a question here in, here in the back, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her here. Yeah, no problem. There you go. Hi. Um, I'm a local artist, and I have an art studio and a school, and we were interested in exhibiting in the gallery. We wanted to learn a little bit how that works. Um, so basically, you would kind of come in and talk to um, our sales team and look and see what dates, you know, what dates you're looking at, if we have the dates available. And then they would get you um, a price on that. Okay. But I will tell you, there are a lot of artists trying to get into the art gallery. And is the room continuously booked with artists? Because I've been in, I've been exhibited here before there with are, the Cultural there Alliance. Small, there are sometimes small gaps, um, but lots of times we, I think we do quarterly kind of events in here. Okay. 
Thank you. You're See, hand raised right here. Here you go. I was wondering, do you have holiday vendor fairs or holiday boutiques with different vendors here? So we do, we do an event in July called Christmas in July. Oh, oh Christmas in July. Christmas okay. in July, if you have a event, um, it, Christmas in July. But they, that's what they specialize in. Is it's kind of like a, a Christmas craft show in July to get your Christmas fix, right? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. For holidays, will you be offering, like, um, opera music? You want to go ahead and repeat the question there? Do you not have anybody asking for opera or trying to present an opera event at this time? I'm going to Yeah, good suggestion, right? right? Yeah, never know. Does, like, a Valentine's yeah. Day. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Good feedback. I did see a hand raise all the way in the back here. Give me one second to get back there. I'll get you next here. Mariana, here you go. Thanks. You're welcome. Do you guys have any Halloween events for kids? We do. Um, we do. Parks and Recreation does a great Spirit Fest event um, near Halloween. And in conjunction with this, um, Slipping my the slip of my tongue right now. Um, they do um, is um, tree trunk. Yeah, tree 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 to the trunk. It's like I can't remember the name of it, but trunk or tree. Trunk or tree. Yeah, there you go. That's it. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, sir. I, I know you had a question as well. Yeah. We, we drive by here frequently, and we love keeping up date with the signs, the electronic signs, but they haven't been on lately, and we noticed you got a new one. Is that coming online shortly? So that project is hopefully, um, so we'll kind of do a two-part thing here. The new sign hopefully should be online here. We were working with the uh, FPL, Sorry, you're behind me. I didn't see you. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, am I going to, to understand the Mid Florida Event Center is separate and apart from the gym portion that runs is run by Parks and Recreation? We are. Okay. We are. So we operate this side of the building um, at the Mid Florida Event Center, and Parks and Recreation Department operates the Health and Fitness Center. 
And thank you for that clarification. I think I saw a hand raised earlier all the way in the back. Did somebody in the back here have another question? No? Okay. Anybody in the front have a question before we formally wrap up our first speaker for tonight? No? Okay. I guess you're off the hook. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for hosting us. Awesome. So this is actually let's open and get next to the mic. This is actually a great lead into our next speaker. So uh, we actually focused on a little bit earlier about like the um, city center. So we act, the city actually is in the process of doing a city center master plan process and where we are here today is a part of the city center. So to talk a little bit more about that as well as other projects that fall within the CRA, which is the community redevelopment area, we have our CRA director, Jennifer Davis, is here to talk a little bit about that. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so, yeah. So good evening, how are you? Um, my name is Jennifer Davis. I'm the CRA director for the city of Port St. Lucie. Right now, I am a department of one, which um, as I start to go through the presentation and show you all the great things going on in Port St. Lucie, you can see why I am actively recruiting for some help. Um, so we'll get into this. Um, again, Community Redevelopment Agency is the CRA. Um, tonight, we're gonna go through a little bit of history of, um, you know, a little bit on Port St. Lucie. We're gonna talk about the basics of a CRA, what tax, tax increment financing is, um, how the CRAs are created, who we are as an organization, and then I'm gonna talk about the city's four community redevelopment areas, and that is the original CRA along US-1, which is where we are here, uh, East Lake Village, which was an enclave that was annexed into the city um, just after the CRA was established. We have the expansion district, which runs down Port St. Lucie Boulevard and includes the port district along the river. And then we have Southern Grove out west. So this is an advertisement from like 1959 with Mackle Brothers. Um, you know, obviously was targeting families up north because for $10 down and $10 a month, you too can own a slice of Florida. Um, and this is a, a legit ad. I actually just bought it off of eBay. It's hanging in my office now. Um, and I was very intrigued at, you know, how this was marketed. I had heard about it. There's actually a great book out there right now called Swamp Peddlers, and it's specifically about Mackle Brothers and the General Development Corporation, and not just this city, but other cities in the state that were marketed this way. It's kind of a cool flashback to um, you know, where we started. But um, I took it upon myself to find out this little graphic here, if you see in the, um, on the ad of where is that? I'm like, I've got to figure out where this is in Port St. Lucie. So I did find it on Google Earth. I searched for a few minutes. It's actually in a county pocket. So I was a little disappointed that it wasn't actually in Port St. Lucie, but um, it was before we incorporated um, in 1961. So a little bit of history on that. Um, so the CRA basics, we are a um, dependent district. We're established through uh, Florida Statute Chapter 163, Part 3. This is not um, an agency that can just pick up and say, hey, I want to do some projects over here, create a, uh, a CRA in this area. We actually have to go through specific criteria to create a CRA. And typically those are associated with areas with slum and blight. So areas where you've seen a lot, of, like in, you may have gone to some downtowns and some other areas around the country, and you'll see some areas that are revitalized. You can tell there's like a new initiative. A lot of those are community redevelopment areas. Um, so the, the primary function for us is to encourage and spur economic growth. So we put into place to be a catalyst to get these areas kind of back up and running. As we go through the different CREs, I'll kind of talk about how they play into that I don't want to call it slum and blight, but the need to have a CRA. Our primary funding is tax increment financing, and that's generated um, on a calculation based on a base year of when a CRA is created, all the taxable value in that CRA is accounted for, and then every year the new taxable value comes out, right? You guys just got your, your notices and you know what your taxable value is. 
Um, a differential there is the basis for our calculation uh, for our revenue. And um, that goes in and that gets to be reinvested in the CRA. So that's pretty cool, right? So we can get revenue generated. It's committed to specifically this part of the city or which part we're going to talk about. Um, and it's just a great funding mechanism. I will tell you from the city's perspective, our CRAs have been um, traditionally, um, we have a lot of debt in our CRAs. So the infrastructure that's out here that was put in years ago, um, our TIF money that's coming in is going to pay for that, to pay the, the bonds that committed to that. Um, so we haven't quite come into a cash positive yet, but I hope to soon and I'll show you how. Um, and then also CRA, I know we mentioned the Community Redevelopment Agency, but the CRA can also uh, pertain to a community redevelopment area. So it's really fun when you write memos and you get to use a bunch of acronyms. So we have um, a governing body and that for the city of Port St. Lucie is our city council. So it is convenient when I do need to go speak to the CRA board, I am speaking to our five council members, so I'm familiar with them. Some different CRAs around the state may have a completely different governing board, but we're lucky that we do have the same ones who are very aware of the needs in our area. So as I mentioned, um, in order for a CRA to be created, there has to be a defined area of slum and blight. There's a report that gets done. Um, the governing body has to actually adopt that report and establish the need for the CRA. And then a plan has to be put in place. So for every CRA that we have in the city, we have an established plan. Uh, as I mentioned before, that tax increment financing is the main source of revenue for the CRAs. Um, and that is kind of that difference between the original value when the uh, CRA was established and the value of the current year. This is a snapshot of our 2022 valuation table. So as I mentioned, we have four CRAs you'll see on the left. Each of the years that they were established, um, the base year for their taxable value. And then um, you have the 2022 valuation, and I always like to include that percentage increase since the base year, especially in the East Lake Village, because that one's like a fun number. It's like 28,000%, it's gone up, but it was like farmland or grove land before, so it had a very minimal value. So our, as of 2022, in the CRAs within the city of Port St. Lucie, our taxable value is about $1.15 billion, which is great. Um, again, our, our board members should look familiar to you. They're your uh, city council members. Um, our executive director is our city manager, Jesus Morejo. We do have legal counsel. As I mentioned, I am the director, and I'm shamelessly going to plug for um, help here in my project manager position. It is posted right now. Um, so the city was incorporated in 1961, and those years you'll see um, kind of how, you know, there was a big gap between the, when the city was incorporated, because, hey, we were 80,000 single-family lots. We thought that was all we needed. Um, so it took, you know, about 40 years or so for the, um, the first CRA to be established where we realized there needed to be some revitalization, and then the others followed after that. This is a map that just kind of shows the uh, location I described to you before. We're over in the uh, pink area on the right here at um, City Center. But again, we have a couple CRAs on the east side and then our west side one just south of Tradition is called Southern Grove. So in the original CRA, this was really, um, this area was intended to be kind of an entertainment district, um, really getting uh, new economic development on the east side. And then it does include, as we mentioned, city center property that we're on, uh, the St. Lucie Medical Center, HCA, um, just to the south of us, and then the residents and businesses along US 1, Village Green Drive, just behind us, um, on Walton Road down to Leonard. So again, I'll just breeze through some of these valuations. Our current valuation for this area is about $527 million, so we're happy with the increase. We do anticipate, as I give you a little project update on what's going on on this property, you'll kind of see um, how that value is going to go up over the next few years. So we are here on the, the mass of the city center property. People, um, this used to be called the Civic Center, and it was so confusing because people would say city center, Civic Center. They didn't know what to call the property or the building or the great question about the recreation center. Um, so we do have a very large kind of quadrant here. It's about 69 acres in total. Now the city does not own all 69 acres. 
Um, up until March of last year, the parcels that were shown in red were held by the Securities and Exchange Commission um, by a court-appointed receiver, and that was due to some fraudulent activity by a, a developer in the past. And unfortunately, the um, activity that she did required the SEC to come in and freeze all of her assets and um, you know, seize them and take them to help pay back the investors that she defrauded. So I know a lot of people have been saying, hey, what's this property doing? It's been sitting here for so long. Why aren't you doing anything with it? With it. Until March of last year, we didn't have control over all those red parcels. So it was really, really hard to promote development um, with something that wasn't contiguous. The second part is while the um, prior developer wasn't doing what she needed to do, none of the taxes were getting paid. None of the special assessments were getting paid on the property. So when the city wanted to acquire the property from the Securities and Exchange Commission, we went to the receiver and said, hey, we think we can um, you know, get this under development and, and spur the growth. And they said, that's great. Go settle the $47 million in debt. Then come talk to us. And we were like, all right, we'll go do that. So we did. And we had a great project team that we worked um, with our prior city manager, Russ Blackburn, um, and our legal counsel. And we went and negotiated all of the, the money that was um, due to the different taxing authorities. Again, you guys just got your tax bill. You know there's a bunch of other taxing authorities. So we had to go talk to most of those and say, hey, we want to um, settle this up. What can we do? Like, what can we exchange? Because we didn't have money to exchange. So um, we got really creative, and we've done a lot of negotiations and have settlement agreements with six taxing authorities, um, the county, St. Lucie um, County School District, the fire district, the Children's Services Council, and a few others. There were also 53 tax certificates on the parcels, and we had to negotiate those with certificate holders. So again, this was a very convoluted process that we had to get through in order to acquire the parcels. So you have a question? I do. I, probably a lot. You want to hold till I get to my next screen that might answer it? OK. OK. So the $47 million that was owed, a good chunk of that was owed to the city. So we were able to, I don't call it negotiate with ourselves, but settle our own debt. Okay. So they did. They had multiple developers that came in and wanted to buy the properties. They didn't just sit on them for the five years that they had them. They tried to sell them. Nobody could make the financials work. None of the other developers. So that's why we knew. Right. Right. And they were not willing to parse out. So if you look at the way the parcels are kind of carved out, they weren't willing to section them out and say, you know, you buy lot 30. Like, it doesn't make sense that 30 is there without assembling it with 31 and 29. So they weren't willing to do that. Again, you know, that was a situation that was presented to us. And does anybody have a guess on how much the city paid in order to take these from the Securities and Exchange Commission? So we settled all our debt, the 47. Zero. Zero. Not zero. Anybody have a guess on, on that one? Yes, we did. 10 million, I hear? 10 million, okay. 4 million up here. One last one, any, any last? What's that? 20 million? So we paid $400,000 for all the property. Okay, so then we're gonna talk a little bit about what we're gonna get in, from that. So um, 
Again, the city owns all the properties in yellow, and now we own all the properties in yellow. So see what that can do for, thank you. Um, when we're doing the master plan, which we're going through right now, we are thinking about what this whole area could be because we have properties along the front. Florida Community Health Center owns this one-story building right at the southeast, or sorry, southwest corner of the property. Um, and they own the two vacant lots there and they're looking to expand their operations. So we're gonna figure out a way to work with them so they can expand their operations and it falls into the master plan. Um, we have a Wells Fargo at the corner and a Tires Plus, which are both great businesses. We do expect that as this site develops that those will probably mold into something else over time um, with those uses being absorbed in the area. We also have the tax collector building that's just on the other side of, um, just to the north of us here. Um, and that building and the 7-Eleven are part of the plan as well. So back in the day, remember I said this was kind of that one project that was gonna spur the Eastern CRA and kind of get things going. This was the original plan from DeGuardiola. This is not the investor that defrauded people. This is the prior investor to that. Um, and this plan, DeGuardiola also did Abacoa. So those of you that are familiar with the Abacoa vibe and kind of that, how that's laid out, very similar plan here. Um, but that plan was done. It's, it kind of contemplated a bunch of different uses. It had a six to eight story program across the whole site. So you'd see kind of what you call a downtown feel, but we're not gonna call it a downtown. We'll call it a destination. Um, and that was the plan that it just kind of sat out there while the project was, we'll call it in purgatory. This is the plan that we've worked with. Um, our Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council has done a lot of work um, with um, economists, with financial consultants, with, um, we worked with the Mid Florida Event Center team in understanding what the event center building needs to be because maybe it doesn't have enough space. Brandon mentioned, hey, we have 400 event days a year and how do you make that happen? Well, if they had more space, they could have more events and generate more revenue but also you could get to um, a destination for events where you could have multi-day events. So you know, probably many of you in your, in your work history have gone to some sort of conference. Maybe you had to stay somewhere. There was a hotel, you stayed overnight, you went to a couple sessions. That's what we envision this, this happening. We don't, we don't envision this becoming a convention center. We're not gonna be a Miami or a Orlando or anything like that with the convention business. But we really feel that there's a need in the Treasure Coast to have a conference center where you can host events. Um, the remainder of this site, um, they do have a um, development plan that contemplates up to 1,800 units on the site. And those would, <clears throat> again, be through a um, six-story program. So these would be apartments up on top. You would have retail and restaurants on the ground floor, so very walkable. Um, we do anticipate two hotels coming to the site, both of about 125 rooms. Uh, we will pull in a police substation. They actually have a small building out back off Village Green Drive. We'll make sure to incorporate police space. We have um, public space set aside um, as well, and I'll show you that. And then um, we have plenty of parking, and I'm gonna show you that too, because I think that's a question we get a lot from people is where are you gonna park? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Sure, we're gonna show the amphitheater. We have, a, we have a proposed amphitheater on the site. This is a pretty detailed site uh, slide here, but it does kind of show the different parking areas and how each of the um, sites would be self-parked. We have a lot of parking here on site. You may not realize it because you drive through. I park in the parking garage every time I come. Um, but that has about 900 spaces. We do anticipate a total of four parking garages by the time the project is built out. And that is in addition to any parking that would be required for each of those other uses. So the um, uh, residential development would be self-parked, likely apartments with a uh, wrapped around a parking garage. That's kind of the cool thing now. You don't necessarily have freestanding garages. They have them where um, you, they're behind the scenes and you don't even know they're there. One of the recommendations that will come out of our master plan will be a disposition strategy. So right now, we're working through the financials that would look at, hey, do we sell it on day one when the plan's done and we know what we want on the site to a developer? That's an option. 
I think the, the council may be a little weary of getting um, into an agreement with one developer. So our recommendation may be let's split up half the property and sell it to this developer and the other half to this because we know there's different uses. Another opportunity might be to do ground leases so that, you know, that's a development strategy where you can, um, you know, lease the land to them and then they can build so they don't, aren't responsible for the upfront dirt cost on it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways, and that's going to be on October 18th. I'm going to present to the CRA board. We will actually, or I'm sorry, the city council, it'll be, we'll be presenting. Where you're doing both, you're incorporating the leasing of the dirt and then also having competitive bidding. Absolutely. Multiple developers so that you have multiple developers that are developing specific projects. So if you have five or six different projects, the developer is responsible for that particular project, which means those projects will get done faster and more efficiently and have one or two developers do the whole kitty boat. Yeah, that's what's going to come out And then you're also maximizing revenues by doing that. We'll be bringing that board to council, and there will be a decision they'll need to make as well. And one of the big decisions they're going to have to make is how much property are we going to set aside for civic use? How much are we going to keep for ourselves? Because, yeah, we can sell the land tomorrow and walk away from it and be done. But the current value of holding the, this property is probably you know, a few million dollars. There's still debt on the property, and somebody would have to take that on. So we're going to look at setting aside some of the land so we can still have those festivals. Brandon talked about Freedom Fest. Like, maybe that's a little too big for the site, but we have a lot of festivals here that are really successful through the course of the year. And one of the suggestions is to move the amphitheater to the southern lawn. Right now, if you've been to a concert here, it's a little tough in the evening time because the sun's right in your eyes. Um, the acoustics aren't the best, so the, the sound's kind of reverberating off the building. So we were looking at how to reorient that on the property. So the suggestion is going to be to put it on the south lawn and orient it to where it has the least impact. Um, won't it be good for parking? Sure, we have plenty of parking. That was the slide before that yeah, I showed. Yeah, I'm just like thinking because you moved it to the area and all the parking. Yeah, so it, it was, so the parking lot, the other part of the parking lot, most of you parked today, right? That's going to be that's actually over here on which one do I hit to go to the laser? Is there a laser? It should be a button there for a laser, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. No? Okay. Just to the left of the green area um, there, between where it says Event Center Plaza and Village Block, on the left side, those are the two green areas. You've got a hotel on one side that would back up to the event lawn, and then you, or sorry, the parking garage, and on the other side would be apartments. So those areas are full of buildings. So we're not going to have the sea of parking that we have now. Those will be incorporated, all the parking again will be incorporated with the individual development. And let's also go ahead and take questions at the end of the presentation, just so we can capture all those on the recording too, all right? Thanks, guys. Go ahead. So again, I mentioned Abacoa as an example um, of kind of, you know, the gathering space is having a lot of good public space. This is another example from Celebration Point in Gainesville. And Midtown in Tampa. So some really active spaces where you do have a little bit of height. Um, you get a sense of, of place and destination. And then Clematis down in West Palm Beach has done a new initiative called Clematis Con Curbless. So a couple sections of their street are actually, they don't have curbs. So during the day, cars come and go, they parallel park on the street. Um, you have a very active street, but then in the evening time, they shut it down for vehicular traffic and it makes it really easy to do festivals and events um, without having those transitions of curbs. So that's something we've contemplated as well. These are just a few of the perspective views that our um, architect with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council has kind of provided us. Don't get hung up on any architecture. They, use, they just had to pick a style to kind of show the, um, the height, the development plan on the site. Um, so we all have the development, um, the architectural guidelines yet. And again, some different perspectives coming into the Mid Florida Event Center. There's the sign out front that Brandon was talking about. Um, energized, you know, not, now it looks kind of big, but in, you know, short time when you have a six-story building next to it, it actually doesn't look that big. And again, some, there's a good example of the plaza, the fountain staying where it is, 
the other plaza becoming a um, event space or kind of active space with a hotel and a potentially a rooftop bar, um, residential, and then a nice traffic circle in there. So again, just another perspective. So that's kind of where we are. I'm going to cruise through Village Green Drive. Does everybody know where Village Green Drive is? Yes? Boulevard knows. Um, so Village Green Drive is if you were coming in over to um, the east side of Fort St. Lucie on Crosstown Boulevard and you come across our, our beautiful bridge on the river there and you come to the stoplight at US-1, if you kept going straight, you would go on to Village Green Drive. And that kind of takes you through what is our original industrial area on this side of the city. Um, a couple years ago, we did a, a master plan to see, hey, th this, this area looks like it needs some um, loving, I guess would be the, the way to put it. But even more so, it's like the number one priority project from the, um, the TPO, the local transportation organization, of a roadway in need of a complete street makeover. So of like 130 roads that would be on the list, this was the number one roadway. So um, we got a, a engineering consultant who came on, worked through kind of what could this roadway be if it grew up into a real roadway with sidewalks and bike lanes and things like that. So they broke it into a couple different segments. And as you can see, for those that have driven down there, you know it's nothing to talk about right now, but if you could see how this area could be um, revitalized with some landscaping, some um, separation on the roadway for pedestrians and bikes. Uh, we've also looked at the Hogpen Slough, which is a um, stormwater area just behind Village Green Drive and how that could become boardwalk area. And as you come down past, um, past the curve there, we actually have Camino de Entrada, the entrance into um, the residential area, and then you come down to Walton Road. And then just south, this is behind us, directly behind us to the east here is um, behind the event center, and it, is a, it opens wide up. We've got a lot of right away there where we can incorporate park features and different public art and things like that. So, this project right now is currently, um, it's been master planned. The roadway is in design. We do have a $2 million raise grant that we received to work on the design and construction plans for this project. We have no funding for the project to be constructed. However, having shovel ready projects in the city of Port St. Lucie is integral for us to get um, grant dollars. So for us to have the road plans ready for this project will set us up for a great opportunity to get grant money to build this project. So we're super excited about that. Again, it's being designed with grant dollars, so we're super excited that we'll have the opportunity. I always, when I give this presentation, point out where the, um, the health center is there, just at the end. So it's just south of the, um, the project limits, but I do that just for a reference when I shift to talk about East Lake Village. So for people that don't know where East Lake Village is, it's just kind of southeast of um, where we are right now. It's off of Leonard Road in Hillmore. The w most people associate it with the Woodstork Trail, if you've ever experienced that over on the east side. It's a beautiful walking trail in the area. Um, this was, an, again, that enclave that got annexed into the city. So it was a kind of a grove land. Again, it was known as Lens Grove back in the day. It's more of a residential area with public spaces and things like that. It does include Mary and Cernudo Park and the East Lake Village segment of the Woodstork Trail. This is the one that had the really high um, increase in the, the valuation because it did start out at about 280000 and is up to um, seven, almost $79 million. And then I'm going to point that out again. Got a little quick video to show you.
Does anybody know why I chose to show that? That is our North Fork of the St. Lucie River. When they filmed Moonraker in the 70s, they used our river to replicate the Amazon. So that's like our little pop culture quiz for here. That's actually the North Fork of the St. Lucie River. So that's my transition into the port district. Here's our river. Um, as I mentioned before, our, our expansion district and port district runs from US 1 um, east, I'm sorry, west down to the river. And then once you get to the river, it goes north up to Lingate Park, and then just to the south past the Botanical Gardens. I think, are we having a, a field trip there, Bolivar? Are we doing anything? No. <laughs> no not, not at the gardens this year, no. The next this is one of the original plans for that district. That along the river, it actually was intended to originally be a mixed-use district. It had a lot of um, residential and commercial uses that you would see kind of north of where the Veterans Park is and where um, Midport Lake is. But that land was um, deeded back to the state of Florida when we had to mitigate the impacts of Crosstown Parkway. So the, the plan that you see here that has a lot of development on it couldn't happen. And actually down where the, the Botanical Gardens is, um, that was intended to be a site that had like a convention center and a hotel and restaurants. So very different than what you see today and what, what I'm gonna show you. Uh, it is in still intended to be a recreation district um, and, and residential areas. A lot of it is preserved. Um, the valuation on this one's gone up about 42% since its inception in 2006. This plan I'm sharing with you, if you've um, seen on social media or any of the press releases that we've put out, this is the park, um, just the Botanical Gardens is right just to the north, we have the preserve just to the south, and then the Anchorage is a um, residential community just to the south of the preserve. So this site is substantially under construction right now. We are building the park, the Pioneer Park Playground, which is a custom design playground. Um, and then we have our event lawn for those that have attended River Nights or plan to. We will be holding River Nights here on site again. And then the buildings you see on the left there are a, um, uh, it's called right now as our, it's being developed, it's called the River Food Garden. So it has a restaurant building and then four little quads so if, you know, Bolivar and I wanted to go have lunch and Brandon wanted to join us, but we each wanted something different, like Bolivar wanted a burger and Brandon wanted pizza and I wanted tacos, we would go get our food, but we'd be able to sit there and dine together. So um, it's kind of a really cool experience outside as opposed to just one restaurant and you're done with it. Um, I have a few other, um, they do have a tiki bar too, for those that might partake in that. Um, but beautiful place to watch the sunset in the evening time right along the river. Um, this property is still owned by the city of Port St. Lucie. It is um, subject to a ground lease now, so the developer is building all of the improvements there and then will be paying rent to the city based on their revenues. Oh, I'm sorry, before I get there, we have the two historic homes, I can't believe I forgot that. Right up front we have um, the Peacock, buildings up front. One is a hunting lodge built in 1952, and the other is uh, a, what we call the Peacock House, and that one was built in 1917. The Peacock Lodge is currently being renovated. It um, last year was painted a beautiful deep red color to replicate the um, stained red cypress. We're stripping it now because it didn't react well to the paint, so it's going to be stained instead of painted. Um, but these are a few of the pictures of the renovations. The entire inside of the building is all wood. It's been beautifully restored by a historical contractor. Um, this building will be used by the Port St. Lucie Historical Society as their uh, museum for the city of Port St. Lucie. It will also have meeting space and it will have their offices. Once uh, we get additional funding, hopefully through a grant with the state, we'll start renovations on the Peacock House. That one has a lot more um, restoration to do. On it. The Pioneer Park Playground, as I mentioned, this was a custom design playground. You won't find these features anywhere else in the entire world. They were designed by a, land, a playground designer um, and engineered and, and fabricated just for the city of Port St. Lucie. We do have a river schooner, which I think we're gonna call Moonraker, right? Just for fun. 
Um, we have a, a 43 foot alligator that kids can climb in and on and under and all around. And then we have a water play area, which is, um, it's all custom built rocks to replicate the, um, the, the rocks in the area. And then it's not an immersive experience. This is not one that kids are gonna dunk in the water or anything. It's more of like a run through and you've got spray areas and misters and things like that and to splash around. It's not meant to be any sort of pool feature. Um, and then we also have a, a playground, a playhouse area. We have a six foot um, slate wall, a chalk wall for kids to draw art. On the back side of that wall and in the bottom right corner is a living wall that will face the botanical garden. So we're working with them on the design of how the, all the um, plants will look facing the botanical gardens. And then we have a jungle dome um, there to climb on. This is a, a picture of a rendering from the master plan for the port district that kind of said, hey, this is what you could do on site if you wanted to put a restaurant there, which I think is somewhat memorialized by what I shared with you before, where you kind of have a few different things going on, but you've got an area where people can um, enjoy outside together. This is the um, uh, cross section from the plans for the river food garden. The architects are going with a um, tropical modernism, you can look that up later, uh, vibe to it. So it's very minimal. The, the point is the, the focus on the um, area is going to be the landscaping. So they intend, it's weird to have an architect design something that needs to fade away, but really that's what they want to do, is to create something where the landscaping takes over and that becomes the primary focus, so tropical modernism. Um, there is a rooftop. Um, lounge here, so you'll be able to watch um, sunsets from the rooftop lounge. This is the one main building that was on that graphic that I showed you, and then again, there'll be some small quads there for some other dining experiences. The, uh, the walls here also open all the way up, so they're kind of accordion style. In our port district, we also have a lot of art that we um, are working on. I know this week I did present to the Public Art Advisory Board so they understand that the CRA has a huge commitment to the arts. And um, in this district, um, and actually the city center property as well, and then the port district, we're really looking to create art trails and art experiences um, of many kinds in, as we work on the development. And then these are some other renderings from the Port District Master Plan. This is a tower that's proposed um, kind of north of Veterans um, Memorial Park out in the Pineland Flats there to get up and be able to have a different experience of observing the river as opposed to just being you know, on the river itself. We're proposing some modifications to the Midport Lake, which is an active stormwater area, but we thought what a great opportunity to create some recreation components there. And let's see if I have any more from this. Oh yeah, just another little niche getting out to the river. And then we're actively working on some branding. So in the coming months, you'll actually probably see some branding coming out this district if you drive down PSL, or not PSL, um, Veterans Memorial or or um, Westmoreland, we're gonna get some banners up on the light poles that show the branding. So you'll start to know like you've arrived somewhere, you've come into the Port District, cause you'll know, you'll start to see it all around you. And our anchor is, is the main feature in that. All right, so we're gonna shift real quick to talk about Southern Grove and I'll talk a little bit about it. And then I did see Maureen's here from the EDC. She's gonna go into more detail on some of the projects that are going on out there and what that means for jobs, but um, the Southern Grove CRA is about 3,600 acres. So the city acquired this back um, in 2012, and it was a um, pretty much it, it was it was um, offered to the city at no cost, but we had to take on the debt that was associated with the property. So. You know, that there were some decisions that were made by council, which I think now we're going to talk about how great that's coming back around for us. Um, but I think what the city didn't want to do is get itself into a position where the property went into receivership, much like what happened here. And they said, you know what, we think we can do this. And we have been. So we created a, uh, not created, we drafted a master plan for that area. And the council really was looking for um, it to be the jobs corridor. You know, like, let's, let's not have everybody leave Port St. Lucie every day. Like, si over 60% of our residents were leaving Port St. Lucie every day to go to work. So we were trying to get jobs 
the you know, next tier jobs that get people to say, hey, I'm going to come and work in Port St. Lucie instead of driving to West Palm or even down to Broward County every day. So that's what this area was intended to be, was be our, uh, our, re our jobs corridor destination. So again, these are excerpts from the master plan. This was done again with Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. They've been really good in, in getting our um, master plans developed. And to date, we have, um, we had about 1,200 acres to develop from the jobs corridor on the commercial side. So all the properties you see in red are sold and develop, either fully developed already or under construction. And then the properties that are in gold are what we call option parcels. So they have, um, especially on the south end, we have a developer who has those properties under option. And then um, the green ones are the ones that are available. But I'm going to tell you a secret. It's not really a secret. Um, the property that I just transitioned to the red there, this is a development that is, should be announced in the coming weeks. Um, it's a very large company coming into the city, providing about 600 jobs. And I think that that's a great opportunity for us to have um, that sort of uh, caliber of an employer here in Port St. Lucie. Um, challenges with that is that we have to change the roadway alignment that we just figured out um, but that's okay because you know that's the things we do we work with our public works department and with our engineers and figuring out how to make that happen because we know that this is a very important project um, in addition I have a, a developer that I'm working on a deal with which hopefully I'll be bringing to the the board in the coming weeks that's that parcel there and then another little one just above it and then this property here at the corner of Becker and Village. So when you look at all of that development, we have very little green left to develop in the jobs corridor. And most of what you see there likely is going to be retail, things along that main village, or, um, Southwest Village Parkway, where you're gonna see you know, some retail, some restaurants, things like that, that help support um, the rooftops as well as the uh, businesses that are there. Um, the development has, you know, risen from just a 15 over half, 15 and a half million to about 447 million as of 2022, and that number is going to go way up. I think uh, Maureen's going to talk a little bit about that too. And one of the things in our CRA, um, you know, I, I learned this early on was um, t don't be afraid to give up the good for the great. So there's been a lot of opportunities. There's going to be opportunities here. There's going to be opportunities. There was with the port when we looked at restaurants, um, and then even out west in Southern Grove, and making sure that we're getting the right fit for Port St. Lucie and doing it right, because we know that there's been times in the past that it hasn't been done. So you know we're not just going to come in with the first person that comes in with an offer. We're going to make sure to put it out for an RFQ or an RFP. And so we get good developers in here, and we've checked their financials, and we know that they have strong capital to be able to do the projects so that we don't get ourselves back into a cycle. So that's just something that I try to work with. It's, it's hard sometimes because we get starry-eyed when you see you know, something looks really great, but you're like, maybe it's too good to be true. So um, you know, I try to really um, be mindful of that. And that's the end of my presentation, and we definitely have some questions um, for anybody. Jen, awesome work. Oh, oh my goodness, so many projects that you are managing. Um, let's go ahead and take some, some questions here. I know it was a lot of information in the time that we were uh, alluded, but I definitely want to give um, you all an opportunity to ask Jen some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and start with this gentleman here in the middle, and I'll make my way back there to you next. Uh, what's the time frame on the port? On the port? Yeah. Okay, so the project, the site work is being done right now. We anticipate that to be done in late spring. So we got a little delay. We were kind of on the tail end of those material delays, supply chain, chain issues. And then we had to work with FPL, much as um, Brandon did for energizing the sign out here. And that took a little bit of time. So they're putting in light poles right now. They're doing the site work. Um, the park will be um, completely done in the spring of 24. The restaurant, though, it will come in after that because they're still going through their site plan review process. They, uh, we negotiated that early this year. They've been working with architects and engineers and getting their site. So they've got like a little acre inside that they'll have 
doing your um, site work once the park's already open. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we have a question all the way here in the back for you. Yeah, it's actually two questions. <laughs> Number one, um, are you able to share the name of this 600 jobs company? <laughs> I'm not, not this time. Okay. But, but you'll, you'll, I, think, I think that the city will, or the residents will be pleased when they, they see who it is. Um, um, could you at least um, share if it's high paying jobs, career jobs, or hourly jobs? Yeah, I'm going to let Maureen go into the different jobs that are coming in. She'll okay. explain a little bit about the different types of jobs and what that translates to. So Maureen will catch that in the next presentation. Okay, and one more question. Sure. So the first, um, this area that you showed uh, um, t to come, development to come in the future, what kind, what, how many years we're talking about? I mean, I got so excited <laughs> seeing all of this and what Post-St. Lucie could look like, you know, but um, I'm hoping I'm young enough to enjoy it, so. <laughs> um, so that's a great question. When we did the master plan in 2020 for Southern Grove, it had a 20 year build out. So we said it's going to take 20 years to get all these businesses here and get all the rooftops built. And we're pretty much in year like four ish, and maybe close to year five. And that's almost done. So we do anticipate that when we put this project out, I can that ask her. our horizon is 20 years for that project as well. We expect it to come much sooner than that. The demand is just there. And I, I easily sold this property yesterday. And so we would have been on it all day, but we know that's not what we want here as the sole use. We know it's a good supporting use, but we have a lot of other things we want to do on the property. So that's one of those, like, yeah, I people, I, it, several times a week I talk to developers who want to take this property, and I'm like, hang, hang tight, we're getting our master plan done because we want to gain control of what happens here. Because that's based on what we have the citizens input from and what the market says needs to be here. So we're, we're really, we're excited. Council's very excited to get this out. So you're not going to see um, anybody sitting on this when the plan's done. This is not a plan that goes on the shelf. This is one that's going to be active. Thank you, Jen. Any additional questions? I saw there was, may have been another hand raise on the middle here. I'll go ahead and come to you. I just had a question about the Southern Corridor area because um, I just bought a house there recently in that vicinity and like when we were purchasing the house, I don't know if the sales guy was misinformed or not, but he told us that like right where like Amazon is sort of, if you go just like a little, I'm so bad with directions, like West, there was gonna be almost like an Abacoa style downtown there. Is Did I miss that? Was that part of the plan? Yeah, so the area down here in the bottom, so there's um, the Amazon, mm -hmm. So that L shape is a property that's we call the Viper Village Lifestyle District. So I would say it's going to have a lot of different pieces on it. It's about like 55 acres. So you're going to see restaurants. You're going to see probably a grocer on there and you know retail and things like that. So we'll have shopping on the south end. I also expect, and I don't have anything. Um, only had to go to her conversation. I don't think negotiations yet. But that large green parcel that's in the middle is also kind of a mid-block lifestyle center. So we may see some of that come there as well. We've been talking to a developer who wants to write some um, better scale restaurants out west. We need it. Yeah. Not thank not you. Food. No. Not, not no. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna work my way back up here. Uh, one final question, if anyone has one last one that they would like to ask before we take a break. Up here, yes. <laughs> no worries. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm just curious if the Botanical Garden, there's a boardwalk. Is that the one that is has been closed down? Do you know the duration or like the time? That's a great question. So I actually, before I came here this evening, I have my monthly meeting with Botanical Gardens. So I meet with them every month. We go over projects and things like that. So the section, there is a section of the boardwalk that caught on fire a couple months ago and has been closed since because of for safety reasons. So um, the boardwalk you can access from the lefties plaza from Bridge Plaza there. You can access there and walk down, almost you can probably walk down pretty close to where the fire was. So you can still experience the boardwalk. 
The contractor who's doing the site work for the park has put in an estimate to repair that section for us, so we're hoping to have it open pretty quick. That contractor is also building the segment underneath the bridge, so it'll connect to the Tom Hooper piece. So we do not like having the boardwalk closed. Um, so you can, like I said, you can access it at the Lefties Plaza there, walk down to the river, you can walk south, um, almost down. It's just, um, there's a door, they open it up. Yeah, 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 initially it was closed, but they were able to, they created a door and they open it up and it gets open and closed each day. So it's not open 24 hours right now for safety. Great work. Well, I just want to go ahead and mention that this will be this will not be the last time that you see Jen. We are going to do two different tours, which that Jen will actually lead. Um, one of them is the city center, which is you know just outside this building. We will get an actual uh, walking tour as part of City University, and then we are also going to visit the Southern Dro Grove Drops corridor. We actually did secure a um, visit of the FedEx facility, so we will be taking a, a tour of that uh, facility later on in, in the in the uh, class as well. So. I will be sending out more information on that as well. I hope you all can attend both of those because it will be a, a definitely a great time and a, you know exclusive opportunity for you all as participants for this program. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but like I said, you will see Jen again, and I just want to thank Jen for, for being here and providing the presentation. Thanks, Jen. All right, everyone, we are back from our, our break here. Um, our next speaker is actually uh, Maureen Saltzer and she is the Director of Communications and Outreach for the Economic Development Council of St. Lucie County, Oops. also known as the EDC. So the EDC was actually founded in 2000, and the Economic Development Council is, was really is dedicated to um, uh, enriching the economic vitality of our community through the uh, retention, expansion, and the relocation of businesses to St. Lucie County. So here to tell us a little bit more about her role with the EDC is Maureen Salzer. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So just a little bit about uh, first about um, our mission. Um, you know, we serve the county. We serve Port St. Lucie and Fort Pierce. Uh, each each. Um, County within Florida has a designated economic development organization that works with the state to bring businesses in from outside and to help local businesses relocate. And we are yours. Um, most of the t statistics that I'll give you are countywide, um, but re remember, even though you're Port St. Lucie, Lucie citizens, you're also citizens of St. Lucie County. So everything that happens in the county actually does affect you as well. Um, most development to date, however, that I'll be talking about has been in Port St. Lucie. Um, but develop an, development anywhere in the county, you know, helps our schools, helps our fire district, and very much more, it, even if it isn't in the city of Port St. Lucie. Uh, we deal with target industries, um, which are listed up there, uh, and we are a separate organization. Um, from the county, from the cities, but we work in partnership with them, and we are funded by both cities, the county, and private businesses. Uh, and uh, there's a separate organization that deals with small businesses, uh, and, and you're gonna hear about that, I think, later on in your um, year-long program. Um, so we've been very busy for the last six and a half years. Since 2017, coming out of the Great Recession, um, we have just been go, go, go since then. Um, there can be really long lead times sometimes between the announcement of a project, and these are announcements, 29 expansions, 43 new businesses coming here, um, and then th these are the industries that we deal with, the target industries, and kind of how they, they um, come out on that. Um, so there can be really long lead times, like for instance, Oculus was supposed to expand uh, back in, I want to say, 2017, and because of, they, they kind of stepped back because of the recession, and now they've just started again breaking ground, so that's been a long time, yet on the other hand, things can happen really fast, Port St. Lucie in particular is great about what these target industries and expedited permitting, getting things done. Um, so, you know, FedEx and Legacy Park opened in less than eight months after we announced it. 
I think it was about a six month construction period. It was amazing. And we tell that story all the time when we're out um, trying, to con trying to recruit new businesses that you don't have to wait years to open your business here if you don't want to. These are some of the businesses that we've worked with in, for expansion or relocation over the years, over the last five, six years. Uh, so you recognize some of those logos, I'm sure. Um, you know, one of the really fun ones was the contender boats. Uh, you know, we used to be an agricultural economy here in, in St. Lucie County, and there was a very large packing house called the P Packers of Indian River. Um, and that meant more Indian River, the territory, not the county. It was on Midway Road. And they employed about 200 people packing, you know, gift fruit mostly. And they went out of business because we have no more fruit. So we had this big, huge building. And now we have much more of a blue economy. We have a lot of marine industry, particularly in Fort Pierce. Uh, and we were able to bring Contender, which has uh, its main location in Homestead. They wanted to expand. And they came up here and they used that Indian River uh, Packers building to now manufacture you know, really, really expensive sport fishing boats. And it's in the area where they used to spray down the oranges to clean them, they're now spraying paint on the boats. So it's kind of really fun. Um, so th those are, you know, the logos of m many of the businesses that we've worked with. And here's what it looks like in terms of economic impact. Um, $1.25 billion in capital investments in the last six and a half years. F more than 15 million square feet of facilities, retained 6,500 jobs, added another 3,000, and the total projected new jobs from just these announcements will end up being about 11,300 when all is said and done. Um, a third party study found that um, our county economy is growing because of these, these um, expansions and locations by $1.8 billion. And, and that's on an economy that was worth about $9 billion. So that's huge. Um, the growth that we've seen, and I think you saw some of the pictures that Jen put up. Um, but these businesses are generate 30, will generate, once they're all open, $39.8 million a year in tax revenues that will support the city, the county, schools, fire district, et cetera. These are the projects that we've announced so far in 2023. And as Jen mentioned, we have a couple more that'll be popping up before the end of the year. I'm not quite sure in a couple weeks, though. <laughs> Might take a little bit longer than that. Um, industrial is really, really hot here right now. Uh, the residential growth brings more need. You know, the more people there are, the more stuff they need. So the more distribution facilities uh, there, that are needed. And it's not just growth here, it's growth all throughout South Florida in particular. And most of South Florida is built out. So there is no room for the kind of industrial facilities that we're putting in right now. Um, so we're, these facilities are not just focused on Treasure Coast, they are actually feeding South Florida as well. Um, so Palm Beach County, Br Broward, Miami-Dade, you can't put you know, a million square foot building in there anymore, particularly not one by the interstate or, or, um, or the, tr the turnpike. Uh, I think somebody was mentioning we had a program yesterday that brought in a lot of brokers and developers uh, and where we were talking about the city of Port St. Lucie and the county. And they mentioned that you know, there are, are some properties that are still available uh, that are about 20 minutes closer to maybe the market that they're looking for in South Florida but in order to get from 95 to where the facility is, you've got to go through 15 traffic lights. You know, our facilities are right off of the, of the turnpike or right off of I-95, so there's not a lot of traffic impact, and those, those trucks can get in and out really fast. So I'm going to tell you just about it. You know, I'm just going to focus on three kind of interesting projects that we have going. Um, Lactologics is really interesting. Whoops, what happened to it? There we go. Um, Lactologics is really interesting. It is a facility, it's unique. The people who are putting this together live here in Port St. Lucie. They are going to take human milk 
and gently process it and package it so it can go to hospitals to feed newborns, particularly preemies. Um, and it is, you know, it is going to be really, really exciting when they open up. We've already gotten a lot of news on that. This was in Florida Trend. Um, right now what they're doing, they're reusing a vacant building in, in that Liberty Medical Complex off of US-1. And they're equipping it now. They've got specialized equipment they're bringing in. And once they're done with that, they expect they'll have about 60 jobs. Biotech. Um, you may have heard, if you've been around a while, about the failed economic development experiments um, pre-Great Recession. And that was true at that time. And, and among those were uh, VGTI and Torrey Pines. And it was really disappointing to see that we really were not able to make a footprint in biotech at that time. And then the taxpayers of Port St. Lucie, you know, ended up having, and the county as well, ended, ended up having to pay for some of the debt that was guaranteed by the city and the county. Uh, and it was pretty, pretty dire at that time. But the vision was good because right now, those two facilities, which are now um, Florida International University's Center for Translational Science and Cleveland Clinic's Florida Research um, and Innovation Center, um, have average wages for their people, both staff and scientists, scientists of about $80,000 a year. Um, right now, FIU and their facility has about 100 staff, and they're, they're looking at expanding up to 300. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic facility is similar. I think they're just under 100. I don't know that they can expand up to 300, but they have some of the best labs, biotech labs, in the country in that facility. Um, so they, these are no longer failed investments. Um, <clears throat> you know, it took the Great Recession to kind of take them, out, to take them out when we were trying to do this originally. And then there was also, at the same time, a huge reduction in grants from the National Institutes of Health, which is really what kind of took those, in, those facilities down. But now that vision is absolutely playing out now, and now the players who, who are operating those two facilities, Cleveland Clinic and Florida, Institute of, um, Florida International University, have deep pockets to support them. So one of the hopes that we have is that over time those scientists when they discover things and they're working mostly on um, viruses like covid alzheimer's things like that as they make a discovery they can have spin-off companies that won't be smaller but then they'll locate next to the parent company and so we're really hoping that that works out but right now that's working really really well it's a it's a type of job that we've never been able to offer people here and now we can And then Jen told you a little bit about Legacy Park. So this is what we have going on there right now. There are two spec buildings. One is 168,000 square feet and one is 520,000 square feet. The 168 is finished. The 520 is just about finished. Um, and they were looking for users for those that will be different companies. I think that they do, do have uh, Ferguson, uh, Ferguson that makes um, construction equipment. Um, has taken some space in one of the buildings, but you know they'll they'll get different companies to come in there, or else they'll find one that you know wants all 520,000 square feet. It's it, the it's a shell basically, so they can build it out inside to however you know the the user wants. Until we get end users in those buildings, you know, we don't have jobs that are you know corresponding to that, other than the construction jobs, which have been significant. Um, there's the potential at, in the park for more than 4 million square feet. More than 1.5 million square feet is complete or just about complete right now. Um, and the developer that's developing those uh, is nationally recognized. So they've really put us on the map for this property. And they really are the ones that got the ball rolling for our economic development spurt that we've had since 2021. Um, um, You'll see Cheney Brothers, that'll finish this year, hopefully, if they don't run into any supply issues. Uh, right above Cheney Brothers is going to be a very sophisticated cold storage warehouse that they've already broken ground on. Uh, and that will, that will rent for a lot of money because, uh, they, as we, they were explaining to us yesterday, there haven't been new facilities for cold storage built for about 30 years. 
Um, so we are at the cusp of that. And then um, above that is probably the project that Jen mentioned that we can't talk much about at this point. But, but look what's been completed so far. This is north of Midway Road. So we have King's Logistics Center, Interstate Crossroads Center, South Florida Logistics Center, and Interstate Commerce Center. And I just wish they'd made different names because it's really confusing. Um, <laughs> but you, you've, seen, you've seen these as you, as you kind of go up and down I-95, and you're kind of wondering, well, what is that? It's particularly this Interstate Commerce Center, it's the smallest piece of those, but you can see it has really great frontage on the highway, so you can see that really well. Right behind it is that South Florida Logistics uh, Interstate Crossroads Center, which is 1.1 million square feet. South Florida Logistics Center is also 1.1 million square feet, and they have a second building that's 245,000. And Kings, I forget exactly the square footage, but you have it in the materials that I left for you, totaling more than 3.2 million square feet north of Midway Road, completed this year. And south is the buildings that we talked about over at um, Legacy Park the 520, the 168, and Cheney Brothers, which will hopefully finish up this year. Oops. So these, these buildings are something that we've never had here before. When we were doing economic development um, for a long, long time, what we kept hearing over and over again was, well, you know, we don't want to have to wait a couple years to, you know, get permits and build a building and whatever, we want to have some property that is ready to go, you know, ready to be built out inside and ready to go so we can be up and running in six months. And that was kind of the name of the game. We had nothing, absolutely nothing, that we could offer um, any of the businesses for decades. Then all of a sudden, like in 2021, that turned around. Now we have built right now or about to be finished 4 million square feet. Um, of, of available in, industrial. And then we have another two million that's already been permitted. So we kind of go out and we talk to businesses who are looking to locate here in Florida. And we, we kind of make these points with them. And that corridors of opportunity was kind of fun because that was the S South Florida Business Journal. South Florida Business Journal never mentioned St. Lucie County whatsoever in their coverage. The way they look at it is we're not part of South Florida um, and they're not going to mention us. So what we did is we took out a special section in there and we told, we told their readers all about what is available here in St. Lucie County. Because a lot of the people who are looking at us are coming from South Florida. Like Cheney Brothers, they want to expand or they want to get out of South Florida. Our rents are lower, our traffic isn't as bad, our facilities are Class A. Um, and they're maybe running, wanting to leave as class B further south, or else they're just expanding because the population's expanding. So we have a great opportunity that we're taking advantage of. We go to a lot of shows, we talk to a lot of people, uh, we do some advertising in the trades, uh, and we try to tell people about what we have here now. So that's part of what we do at the EDC. And the other part is it doesn't do any good to build all these buildings. Um, if we don't have people to work in them. 60% of the workforce in St. Lucie County drives somewhere else for work every day. Now that's not 60% of the residents, because a lot of them don't work, but 60% of our workforce goes somewhere else to work every single day. It creates a lot of bad traffic. <laughs> it's not fun. And we actually have jobs here that are really high quality jobs that we need to let people know are available, depending on you know, what your skill level is and your skill set, right here, right now in this county. And as these users come into these industrial buildings, they're going to need more and more. So we do a, a bunch of things uh, to let people know about that. We have a hashtag Work Local St. Lucie campaign that we've been doing for about three years. And in addition to that, we've got some quit your commute messaging. We do job fairs, we do social media, we do billboards, we do signage at the Jobs Express um, transit facility, which I hate <laughs> because it you know, was designed to take people from this county south instead of keep them here. And so we put up that sign 
right as kind of you're tired and you came home, you picked up your car and you're driving out of the parking lot and so you can see our work local sign there suggesting that maybe you want to take a look. We have a website where you can go that will list links to the employers in the area and feature jobs. Um, and the, the other interesting thing that we, we tried and it worked really well was with Waze. You know, I don't know how many of you are, deal with Waze as, as a navigation tool. But a lot of people who commute south in particular um, put that on even though they obviously know where they're going to work, but they want to see whether you know, it's better to take 95 or the highway, I mean the turnpike or whatever that day. And so we set it up so that anybody during commute times going south would get a message the next time they stopped that said, hey, quit your commute, that little message up there. Um, and you know, kind of sent, us, sent them off to our website. And then coming home at night when they Cross Becker Road back into St. Lucie County, um, they got a message you know, when they pulled into their driveway, really tired after a long day of work and a long commute, saying, hey, you know, check it out, we got jobs here. Because we, you know, in order to be successful, the two things have to go together. We have to have the facilities and we have to have the workforce. And we also get involved in training programs. We work with the high schools and we work with Indian River State College to make sure that the training programs that are being offered are a match with the kind of businesses that are coming in. Um, so for instance, um, both the high schools and um, IRSC have you know, a lo logistics programming. Um, and skilled trades are huge, so they both have skilled trades options, welding, that kind of thing. And we work very closely with them to ensure that um, that those two match up for our new workers. So you can be saying to yourself, all right, well, so I don't care. I've already got a job or I'm retired. So what's in, in it for me? Well, just these six projects here have $3.8 million in tax revenues. And two aren't even finished yet. So, so you, know, you, don't, you don't see those really big numbers on there, the two that have the blue marks. Um, once they get finished, then whenever the next tax roll comes around, they get put on that tax roll. Um, so you'll see, uh, for instance, um, Excel International showing only $24,907 in ad valorem taxes um, for this coming year. And this is based on the trim notices. Uh, and that will leap up to probably somewhere around the 600,000, five to 600,000 next year when they get on the tax roll. Everything's in, in um, arrears for taxes. Um, so just showing those right now is $3.8 million. And take a look at the completions that I showed you a few slides back. Those are not on the tax rolls other than maybe this small amount like the Excel right now. So think about what will be next year in terms of what's going to be added to the tax rolls. And that's important because what these companies pay, we as PSL residents don't have to pay. Um, a lot of times people will complain about the tax rate here and the, the tax percentage. But the reality is that things cost what they cost, so the lower your property values overall, the higher your tax rate. For years and years, and I'm, I'm, you've probably already covered this in this class about how Port St. Lucie was developed. It was developed as primarily residential, almost no commercial, you know, no industrial, no jobs. Um, and because of that, the tax rates on residential are high. The more industrial we can get, the lower the tax rate can drop. We were kind of hoping some of those buildings that I showed you would have gotten on the tax rolls this time through, but they didn't. Uh, the only two that got on there were, um, in, in this round, were the two Amazons. But if you take a look at that one on Midway, okay, that one on Midway is generating for this community, for this county, um, diff depending on, you know, th for the schools, for the fire district, for, this, for the county, for the city, $2.3 million in taxes. You know, that's $2.3 million we would have had to pay otherwise. And the way I like to explain it that makes it kind of easy to understand is, you know, um, sometimes when you add growth, you're also adding expense. But with these buildings, there's very little expense. You know, there's no schools. You know, they don't send anybody to school. There's no school impacts. Very little fire impacts because they're all being built with these really sophisticated um, fire suppression systems. 
Um, so take a look at your tax bill and take a look at what you're paying for Crosstown Parkway. That's a set amount, you know, X number of dollars got borrowed to build Crosstown Parkway and it has to be paid back in a bond. And that means that if we don't have companies helping us pay it back, then we're all going to pay it back ourselves. So just TAMCO, TAMCO alone, um, this coming year will pay $17,000 toward the retirement of that bond. And he said that's a, that's a straight um, trade out. If, if TAMCO hadn't paid that 17000 we would be paying it as residents. So even though you may not need a job, these facilities are going to help you a lot over time. Um, the Amazon at Midway is going to pay $650,000 to our schools this coming year. And it's not even open. So that's kind of the benefit of this development to myself and yourself as Port St. Lucie residents. So that's pretty much, I gave you our annual report. It's kind of late in the year, so I also gave you a, a um, QR code where you can look at our mid-year report, which we don't print because it's more extensive and it's expensive to print those things. And um, any questions? Thank you so much, Maureen. Any uh, questions for Maureen? I want to go ahead and just add that you know I, I do appreciate that the, the the city and really ultimately the county prioritize keeping you know our residents here for uh, for job opportunities. So a lot of work, a lot of successful work has, has definitely happened within the last um, couple of years, and you know more will definitely come you know in in these job corridors for sure. Um, I did see you have your hand up here for a question. You mentioned that 60% of, of working residents leave Port St. Lucie. Yes, we'll leave the county. Okay. What about people that move into Port St. Lucie? Are they all senior citizens that don't need a job? Or why would someone move into Port St. Lucie and get a job? We're, because we're, actually, we're, we're on, I forget the exact number, but we're number four, is it, in the country for young, um, for first-time homeowners? Because we're affordable. Um, no, no, are they currently, like, renting or living at the parents' house? I mean, where are these people coming to work in Port St. Lucie? Where do they come from? Well, that's not what I said. What I said is the people who live here in St. Lucie County are commuting outside St. Lucie County for work. Right. Okay. So, so th these projects are to keep to the people keep those that are people from having to commute. Okay. Okay. So there, there are no, there are no uh, emphasis placed on getting people outside. Port St. Lucie to come here, get a job, buy a home, become model citizens. Not, not by us. I think that actually we've kind of been discovered as a really great place to live. So we, we, don't, we don't get involved in residential in any way, shape, or form. We're strictly target industry related. Now, you've got realtors, you've got other people. I think for, um, FPL has a program to try to attract skilled workers to come here because we do have a lack of skilled workers in Florida. Um, and so I think they've got some programs going, but we don't get involved in that. Okay. Thank you. I have a, I have a question. Um, I've noticed um, a lot of the companies coming in are warehouses. A lot of them are warehouses. And some of my people are saying that they want more upgraded restaurants here. I want to know, are you attracting large corporation offices here as well that will bring people who have money to live here? Um, corporate headquarters are one of our targets. That is not something that we've been terrifically successful in doing right oh, now. Oh. We've been bringing in, brought in a couple, but we don't necessarily have the workforce that they're looking for. Um, because it's all about workforce. When people look at uh, where they want to locate, workforce location, and we don't 
tend to have that kind of workforce here. Um, really? Who's been very, very successful at that with their Wall Street South program is Palm Beach County. Um, and they've attracted a lot of the financial institutions. Yeah, and I was hoping they would, that, uh, they would be coming here. The well, maybe sometime. But right now, and right now it's hot for us just because of the, what I mentioned about the land, is that we have that available land right by the highways. Right. And, and you know, for every new person that comes to South Florida, and there has been a ton lately, um, you know, they, they need to be serviced by chain brothers. Mm. Uh, Cheney Brothers services restaurants. The more people, the more restaurants, the more Cheney Brothers is needed. So that's kind of why Cheney Brothers opens. We deal. We don't deal with retail at all. I know at one point the city had um, a, an organization. They were they were trying for recruitment of retail, and I don't think that they have them anymore. Um, basically, retailers what they do is they look at the demographics of an area and they decide where they're coming. Because I'm finding, because I live on the west side by the tradition area that the houses have increased a lot. a lot. And some people can't even afford to live in that area because it's, and I thought that would bring in corporation people that would move in to that area. A lot of those are 55 and up. Um, mm. So there, that doesn't help our demographics any in terms of uh, attracting workers. That was an excellent question, for, for sure. Uh, I really like that question. Uh, any additional questions from anyone in the in the back here <laughs> for Maureen? Oh, yes, ma'am. Just a quick one about the website for the um, work local. Mm -hmm. What was the website, or is it in the manual here? Um, it, it, it is in there somewhere, but I can tell you it's pretty easy. It's www.worklocalsamc.com. Okay. And, and that will actually take you to a page inside of our page. Okay. And um, what we do is we've got about four featured jobs that we keep, that we rotate on that, to, and then we have, um, based on what kind of industry you're interested in working in, there's little boxes you click on that that will take you to um, the uh, links to the job pages for a lot of our local employers. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Maureen. I don't think there's any additional questions. I really appreciate you being here today and providing the information to us. No problem. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. to our final speaker for tonight. And as our final speaker, we wanted to provide a special presentation to you all. Um, we do have our emergency operations manager for the city. Uh, Mr. Shane Ratliff is here. And actually, Shane and I were just talking about, um, during lunchtime a year ago, he actually presented for the first time for City University. And then, ironically enough, uh, one week later, Hurricane Ian hit. So the students at that point in time actually got to hear tips on um, you know, hurricane safety and really just emergency um, safety in general. And sure enough, a week later, we ended up getting hit by a hurricane. So um, a lot of them did value that information that they did receive um, from Shane last year. So hopefully, um, hopefully we don't get hit by a hurricane this year. But if we do, you will be prepared because Shane will get you guys up to speed for sure. Um, so with that said, um, here to provide an, a presentation for the Office of Emergency Management is Shane Ratliff. Welcome, Shane. Thank you. I hope this is removable because I refuse to be chained to a lectern. <clears throat> I walk around, I move around, I talk to people, I point at people. Um, I find it's the best way to take boring material and help you pay attention to it. If I'm moving around and it's boring and I'm talking and pointing at you, you're going to focus on me and you're going to pay attention to what I'm saying. If I tell boring stuff from up there, you're gone in two minutes. So <clears throat> anyway. Got a very short amount of time to go over a whole lot of information. So when you see me hit past a slide, uh, I told them to take that out of my presentation. The, the, the little things that move slow, I don't want it to do that. I want it to go directly to the next slide. Um, so when you see me skip through a slide, don't worry about it. It's not that important. It's probably something you hear from Steve Weagle or, or uh, uh, Chris Martinez or any of those on TV. They talk about it all the time during hurricane season. I'm not going to repeat that to you. I'm going to repeat the stuff to, or tell you the stuff that really important for you to know to be prepared for emergencies. And hurricanes is not the only emergency. We're going to talk about other emergencies that could happen right here at any given time that most people don't even think about. Um, 
For example, do you know there's a nuclear power plant right across the intracoastal? Do you know how far radiation travels if the wind's blowing towards you? All the way to 95. So if you live east of 95 and something bad happened there and the wind is blowing in the westerly direction, radiation will be spread over the entire city. But lucky for us, there's never been anything ever happened there, never been anything even close to happen there. The only nuclear incident we've ever had in the United States was at Three Mile Island, and if you go back and watch the new updated thing about Three Mile Island, it didn't actually happen. Um, and when I say that, it wasn't actually boiling over and ready to release, it never released any radiation or any of that stuff. The gauges were wrong. The gauges had quit working and were telling it that it was boiling over. They treated it like it was, because that's what you have to do, but radiation never actually left the plant. So. Um, nobody, you know, that's why you didn't have people in Pittsburgh area, you know, having children with three heads or anything like that because it never actually emitted radiation. Um, <clears throat> anyway, first we'll talk about hurricanes, tropical activity. These are our thresholds. Everybody knows those. Tropical depression, less than 39 miles an hour. Tropical storm, 39 to 73. Hurricanes start at 74 mile an hour and get classified every so many miles an hour past that. A watch, this is down there in the bottom right, a watch means it's possible within 48 hours of them issuing the watch. A warning is expected to happen within 36 hours. So just because we, get, we got hurricane watches during Ian last year, but we never had hurricane force winds. We did not get a hurricane warning. We got a tropical storm warning, which meant we were expected to get tropical storm force winds, which is 39 miles an hour, and we did indeed get that. So make sure you pay attention to the difference between watches and warnings because when it gets close, they're issuing them one right after the other, right after the other. Pay attention to what it's saying it is, and that's kind of giving you an idea of what you should expect. All right, everybody knows that there's five categories of hurricane, one, two, three, four, five. That's the uh, wind for those. Uh, storm surge, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's what kills the most people. Uh, if you remember Hurricane Ian when it struck Fort Myers Beach, I think it was 114 people that, that ended up dying. Almost all of those were because they drowned. They were, it was storm surge that killed them. It was not the winds. Um, if, if they were in a house, you know, they were in a house that was able to stand the wind, but water was up to the roof, so they drowned inside their own homes. So storm surge is the thing that kills the most people. That's what we really, really focus on. Our evacuation zones, which we'll talk about, are based on the level of storm surge that could hit. It's not based on wind. If, if it's a category one, but they're expecting 15 feet of storm surge, we will, we will, or the county will, pull the trigger on all the evacuation zones because 15 feet of storm surge means those evacuation areas are going to have 15 feet of water on them don't matter what the category of the storm is it's, it, because it's not about wind, it's about storm surge. So we'll talk a little bit about storm surge here. As you can see, so we have a normal tide, right, that comes in, goes out. Then you have things that we call king tides down here, which unfortunately coincide with the peak of hurricane season, September, October, right? So that's when your king tides are going to happen anyway. And then you have what we had during Adalia uh, a couple weeks ago, the full moon comes along with that. Tides are higher during full moons too. So if the normal tide is here, let's say that's zero, okay, the king tide makes it two, and the full moon adds another one to it, then they say there's 15 feet of surge coming with this storm. It's pushing 15 foot wall of water in with it. You gotta take the three you've already got, add the 15 to it, it's going to be 18 feet above what zero is. What you normally go out there and look and say, oh, that's pretty, it's going to be 18 feet higher than that wall coming towards you. Um, don't be fooled. Um, <coughs> Lee County, which is Fort Myers, Fort Myers Beach, uh, their EM director uh, spoke to us at our uh, uh, conference that we have for emergency managers at the Florida Emergency Preparedness Association. And she, Somebody asked her, what was the most surprising thing you found out after the storm that helps, that, that's going to help you going forward to help your residents be prepared, more prepared? And she said, you're not going to believe me when I tell you this. She said, I walked around Fort Myers Beach three days after the storm, and I asked people, 
why did you stay? Because so many people stayed. And they said, well, they said the storm surge was only going to be 15 feet. She's like, what do you mean only going to be 15 feet? Well, that means that if the water is normally right there on the beach, it'll come 15 feet further up the beach. So we have now been, the emergency management community are rallying the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center, to use other language other than storm surge because people do not understand what it means. We, we're, we're saying, if you say storm surge, follow it up with a wall of water. And I noticed on Adalia, they did say that. They said storm surge, which is a wall of water of up to 15 feet or whatever it was for Cedar Key, they started putting that in our messaging. Because we want you, the citizen, who may have never heard a presentation from an emergency manager before, to know that storm surge does not mean it's only coming 15 feet further up the beach line. It's 15 feet high, and if your house is only 12 feet high, your house is completely covered, and if you're in it, you're completely dead. So, storm surge, that's the thing that kills you. As you see, 49% of all storm deaths occur because of storm surge. You can see the other stuff, tornadoes, winds. Uh, wind is only 8%, and that's usually because of a flying object that pierces through you if you're standing outside in the wind. Um, surf, believe it or not, you, you see every time there's a storm coming, what do you see? Everybody goes up and tries to surf, they end up drowning, um, <clears throat> and then rain. Uh, rainfall. People wreck their cars trying to get out and evacuate because they wait too late to evacuate till the, till the storm's already at the front edge of it's already here. Then they wreck their car, you know, go into a canal, something like that. All right, this is Fort Myers Beach. We've added this video. It's about 30 seconds. It's like a 30 second uh, lapse of about 12 or 14 hours in Fort Myers Beach. I want you to look at this. Don't have a laser, does it? Right up above the tops of these three palm trees, there's a house there. And if I could get these lights off, you'd be able to see it, because I don't think you'll see it when I start the video. The front door has um, vertical blinds. And as it's time lapse, and you will see those vertical blinds go up and down, up and down. There's someone in that house the entire time. This is literally across the street from the beach, Fort Myers Beach. And you'll see what happens. And this is a camera off of a pole, that you know, a pole camera that they have there in the downtown area. But, oh, God. Yeah, see if we can get it up here. Or maybe I push the wrong button. I push the play button. Every one of these are different. Number six. Oh, okay. There you go. All right, so you'll see. You can see the white. See it going up? There it's up. Now it's down. Now it's up. There's the signs blowing over. See the water filling up the street as the storm surge comes in. And you will see here in a couple of seconds, the house will come off of its foundation, and it ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, along with whoever's inside of it. Yeah, it's like a, I think it's like a 12-hour loop done in 30 seconds. Yeah. But yeah, so that's why we say storm surge. You'll always hear emergency managers say, run from the water and hide from the wind. So if, you, if they're telling you that water's coming, get out, because you can't do a thing against water. Um, now wind, you can get inside of a good sturdy structure. The wind goes, passes by, and you're OK. But you can be in that same good sturdy structure, and the water come, come right in all the openings and fill up to the roof. You know, so. Run from water, hide from the wind. We're going to skip that, indirect fatalities. Um, you've noticed, if you pay attention, if you're one of those weather nerds like I am, you probably noticed that over the last 20 years, the cone has gotten significantly smaller. It's because they're getting better and better with the models. They're getting better and better at forecasting where a storm is going to hit. What they're not really good with is intensity. They're still not good on knowing whether there will be a Cat 1 or a Cat 5 when it gets there. But they can tell you where it's going to hit. Um, we saw that with Hurricane Michael. This is uh, Hurricane Michael. Um, as you see, Saturday, 5 p.m., it was 30 mile an hour. It was a tropical depression. It was nothing. Basically, a, a, a storm that we would have here, we had here yesterday. It's about, about what that is, a tropical depression. 
and they were predicting that it would only be 70 miles an hour going into where it pretty much within a few miles of where it actually went into three days, or I'm sorry, from Saturday to Wednesday, five days later. Here's Wednesday morning. It was 145. It wasn't 70. It was 145. It was a strong Category 4, and when it made landfall, it was indeed a Category 5. It had reached 157 miles an hour, and it completely decimated, leveled Mexico Beach, except for two homes that were built on piers and had been built under the new Florida Building Code, which was put in in 2003. Those were the only homes that survived. Fort Myers Beach, same thing. Uh, Joel, uh, has the building department done it yet? Okay. Does he do it or no? Okay. When you ask your questions to Joel, ask him about the, uh, the views of the homes because he actually went over there. He's part of a group that does surveys after uh, for like building, building people. He does surveys to find out what works and what don't so that they can update the International Building Code because he's on the committee for that. And he and I were talking, and he's like, you know, every home built after 2003 under the new Florida Building Code actually was still standing. They may have had a roof ripped off, but they were still standing. But every single one built prior to 2003, non-existent. It was a sand lot. And I'm like, wow. And he said, that's how good our building code is. He said, go to another state, build it under their code, and put it here in Florida, they would all be gone. We have really, really made strides on our building codes in Florida and it all started because of Hurricane Andrew in 1992. <sighs> Hurricanes don't care about our timelines. They will do what they want to do when they want to do it. They will tell us it will be 100 mile an hour and it'll be 200 mile an hour. It'll do, it does what it wants. We try to predict it. We try to harness nature, but we can't. Um, like I said, we're getting really, really good. Not we. National Hurricane Center is getting really, really good at telling you where it's going to go. They still can't tell you how bad it's going to be when it gets there. Um, here's our evacuation zones in St. Lucie County. The ones that are in red is zone A. So those are the first ones they call for evacuation. As you can see, it's the barrier islands. It's also everything east of the St. Lucie River in red there you see. The ones that are in orange is zone, is zone B. That's the second zone that they would call. That is everything to the west of the river. Why would that be? Why would the east side of the river be the first, you know, we tell them to evacuate but not tell the people on the west side? It's the same river, right? Because if you remember Francis, Wilma, Jean, that, those years when those storms came through, you know, back to back to back, two of them came right up the St. Lucie River, right? And storms turn counterclockwise, hurricanes do, which means the storm surge is pushing to the northeast as it comes in and it's pulling away on the southwest so it'll actually the river will get lower on the west side it'll get higher as it's pushing water up on the east side if it's coming up the river so that's why they call it zone a before they call it zone b so depending how strong the storm is where it's expected to come in will tell you where it's going to push the water but I can tell you right now, if there's going to be, if there's a storm that's supposed to come up the St. Lucie River, they're going to call both of them. They're going to say, eh, everybody evacuate. So if you're in either one of those zones, but I can tell you after it's over, there will be more water on that east side, more damaged homes with water on the east side than the west side because of how the storm turns counterclockwise. Other hazards. Other hazards. Come on, quit. All right. So, how many of you have flood insurance? A few of you? You notice prices have went up, right? We are, we are arguing vehemently against FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program over that because when they came up with this new risk methodology, they told us that people who lived in X zones, you know, which are the, the least likely to flood, doesn't mean you won't flood, you're least likely, would probably go down. So. 40 to 60 percent of policies, the price would go down. But people who live like on barrier islands, beside rivers, they were going to go up significantly. What really happened? Everybody went up. I have yet to find one person with a flood insurance policy who actually got a reduction. I was talking about it today. We had a meeting with uh, some of our insurers <coughs> as part of our uh, local mitigation strategy. We had a meeting with some of our insurance agents. They underwrite flood policies. And I said, can you tell me since risk 2.0 went into effect, have you written any policies that actually reduced for the, for the client no matter where they live? And they're like, mm, no. 
Matter of fact, I live high and dry in his X zone and mine went up. And I'm like, okay, so you proved my point. So we, as in, when I say we, emergency managers, state government, um, have been complaining to Congress. Congress has been subpoenaing FEMA for their methodology of how this got implemented. They refuse to give the information to Congress so far because they say it's proprietary. It was done by a third party company and it's proprietary data, blah, blah, blah. So we'll see how that plays out, but I think we're gonna see another change in how the insurance methodology is done probably within the next five years once they figure out how it was done this time. But I will still tell you, your homeowner's insurance will never cover water coming into your house. So if you don't have flood insurance and you live somewhere where, ooh, look how pretty the water is, that's why you bought that house, you better have flood insurance because you're going, you are much more likely to flood than anybody else, and Florida, in general, is much more likely to flood than any other state in the country because we're flat and we're sand. So uh, Florida is, is the most flooded state. Uh, I think California, if you count the mudslides, is probably number two, and then Texas behind them because they get hurricanes just like we do. Um, but, yeah, Florida's number one far and away for flooding incidents that occur. We have several every year. Um, who maintains your local neighborhood canals, lakes, and ponds in your gated community? It is not the city. Don't, I can't tell you exactly which one it is, but I can tell you it is not the city of Port St. Lucie. If you lived in a gated community and you pay HOA fees, more than likely it's your HOA. Or the developer, like in tradition, it, HOAs don't actually own the property. It's the, I, mean, you, I guess you own the property, but the developer is the tradition, whatever they call it. You know, it, but the city doesn't control those. So when you call the city and say, oh, it's getting, you know, it's rained a lot and it's getting big, our answer is going to be call your HOA or call, you know, whoever you're paying that money to every month because they, the, they have the thing that they can open that with and drain it into the canals so that it can then be flushed by the city or by South Florida Water Management District to the ocean. But it has to get there first, and they control how it, whether it gets there or not. So don't, 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 don't bother yourself with calling the city and saying, please get that out of my pond because we, don't, we can't control your pond. Um, if you live in St. Lucie West, anybody live in St. Lucie West? I found out just recently most of the properties in St. Lucie West are controlled by that St. Lucie West, whatever it's called, services district. They do control those ponds. But outside of St. Lucie West, those properties, it's controlled by the individual HOA or individual developer that originally developed it. Because part of what they had to do to develop it is sign an agreement with the city that they would maintain that. And that the city's not doing it for them. And they all signed it, so. <laughs> Usually we bring Colt with us from Public Works when we do our outreach program, and he, he has to explain that to them. They signed a contract, they have to do it. <laughs> we, we can't do it. <laughs> Um, flooding, basic safety tips, everybody knows, turn around, don't drown. Uh, nuclear, there we go. We talked about this, there's the plant. You got all these areas, if you live within these areas, you should be getting, and I dare say you probably do get it, from FPL once a year you get some kind of card in the mail that says, you live in one of these zones and here's how we will notify you and here's our website to go to to find, everything, find out everything you need to know including videos and training of how you, you know, how you would shelter in place if they said you need to shelter in place. But like I said, there's never been an incident at that plant. There's never been an incident, an incident where there was an actual radiation leak at any plant in the U.S. except for the one, you know, that Three Mile Island, which actually did not actually leave the plant. It stayed inside the plant the whole time. It was just the gauges were saying, like if the gauge, if 100 pounds per square inch means it's you know, melting down. The gauge was saying 160, but it was really 80, or really 95. It was right at the edge, but it never actually went over. Uh, here's some more, oh, okay, there we go, cdpsl.com slash em. We have a link that'll take you to that specific radiological site for our residents, uh, or anybody that's in that area at FPL, because if you just go to fpl.com, you might be hard pressed to find it because they've got a very big website with lots of deep holes that you can dive into. If you go to our website, click on the nuclear, we got a link that takes you directly to that page so you can go and see that there. And it talks about all these things. 
that's like the siren testing schedule. They, you, they test them at a certain time every so often. It, it's not random, they, it, and they publish it every year. So you'll know that when it goes off, at tw it's always 12 noon, but you don't know what the days are unless you look at the schedule. Wildfires, common hazard, 1999. Most of the east side of Florida burned because of wildfires. We had so much forest so close to cities that when the forest, you know, decided it was going to burn because it was extremely dry, um, hadn't had rain in months. And all it takes is one person lighting a campfire and then leaving the next morning not putting it out, and all of it goes up, right? So I remember I was, 1999, I was, I was just getting out of college, and we came down here to what the college students do in Florida, but I remember we were going to Daytona Beach, and you couldn't get to Volusia County because Flagler County, the interstate, was closed for days because it was literally burning on both sides of the interstate. It had jumped I-95 and was burning both sides. Um, so, yes, wildfires, we don't have that big of an issue with that now unless you live right on the border of the savannas, which they do a really good job doing control burns to kind of keep the scrub and stuff down over there. Or if you live in the farthest western portions of the county where it backs up to the old, you know, forests that are still there. <coughs> People ask about tradition. I'm like, no, they cut every tree over there when they develop tradition. Everything you see there is less than 10 years old. Um, so we don't have a lot of old trees that are dry and ready to burn over in tradition. The developers took care of that. Um, and when they put the palm trees in and got rid of the pine trees. Uh, you can find more information about wildfires at our same address. If you see somebody lighting something and walking away, report it, please. You may save a whole community's life. Um, prepare your emergency supply kit. We've got things that will tell you how to prepare your home to be more friendly or, I guess, anti-friendly to fire. Um, you know, like don't plant all the stuff right up against your walls because if it was to ever catch on fire, it's going to catch your house on fire too. All right, the four things when you leave here today that we want you to remember, and it's all over our website, all of our campaigns, the cards we just gave you, um, you can scan the QR code. It's going to tell you the, how to do these four things. Know your zone, which means know your evacuation zone, whether you're in one or not. Know your flood zone. That way you know what your risk is for flooding. Make a plan. Does everybody have a written plan that everybody in their home knows about of here's what we're going to do if we have to take, you know, if we have to grab everything and go right now? Does everybody know where we're going, where we're meeting? Does our family that live in other states know, don't call us? Call this one person that we're going to designate, and we will give all our updates to them because the last thing we need down here is if a hurricane goes through, is for everybody in the state of New York to try to call down here and talk to you. They're not going to get through, and then it's going to hinder our ability to get what we need to, to, to help our citizens respond to the emergency afterwards. So we tell you in your plan, designate one person that doesn't live here, that way in case they evacuate too, one person that doesn't live here in your family that you will give your, you will call that person as soon as you can and give them the information, and everybody else in your family around the country, don't call you, call them. That way it can jam their phone lines in Missouri and leave our phone lines open so that we can respond to the emergency, right? Build a kit. Does everybody have a kit ready, a, a kind of a go kit that you'd, if you had to evacuate uh, with your things like your insurance papers? Make sure you put your insurance papers in there. I can't tell you how many people have told me, oh my God, it took my insurance weeks to even get me a hotel. And it was because they didn't have their insurance policy number. And if you, don't, if you can't give them, it, when they first show up, they've got a laptop in their hand. We probably don't have Wi-Fi working at the time. And if you can't give them a policy number, they can't find you. So you go to the back of the line as far as they're concerned. They're wanting to try to get as many people as they can as quickly as they can set up. So if you can give them that policy number, they can go ahead and start your claim. But if you can't, they might not be able to look you up until a couple of weeks later when everything, as far as the internet and stuff, gets restored. So take your insurance papers with you in your kit. Food, water, seven days. Seven days worth water, one gallon per person per day. Um, make sure you have 
that but now that you're not going to carry one gallon per person per day with you as you leave right that's for for those of you who live in sturdy homes and have no intent of evacuating make sure you have that because Publix might not be open for three or four days when Dixie might not be open for three or four days Walmart might not be open for three or four days that's how you're going to be able to drink water and eat food during that time is is to have your own stuff and then stay informed because everybody signed up for uh, alert st. Lucie Anybody? Yeah. Okay, some of you have. All right, so St. Lucy, St. Lucy, or S-T, Lucy, I always try to say St. Lucy, and people say, well, I put S-A-I-N-T, and it didn't work. stlucy.co, slash, or, yeah, stlucy, stlucyco.gov, slash, alert. So St. Lucy County's website, slash, alert. So if you know what St. Lucy County's website is. It will automatically redirect you to another website that says Everbridge. That's okay. Everbridge is the third party vendor, the platform that hosts it. So because you get to Everbridge, don't think, uh oh, this isn't the can't this isn't what I'm supposed to be. It is what it's supposed to be. You set up an account, you can put inside the account what you want to be alerted of. Do I have that on here? Uh, that's some stuff that's in your kit. There we go. You can set all these things for it to alert you if you are really bored and want your phone to go off all the time. Um, or you can set the things <laughs> that you just really want to know about, such as like on my, th this is actually a screenshot for mine and I've took some of them off since then. Um, like I, if you notice, I always put the warnings, flash flood warning, aerial flood warning, flood warning. I don't ever want to know about a watch because I know, I, I can look out the window and tell if it's raining. I want to know when it's rained to the point that it's actually going to flood. That's what I want to know. So, uh, because believe me, if you don't set quiet hours and all that stuff on it, because you can do that too. You can set it to not send you anything between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., whatever you want to put. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. I have to keep it all on, so that's why I don't put the wa watches on, because I don't want to get, every time it rains, the uh, flash flood watch that they put out six times at 2 a.m. in the morning. I don't want to get that, so I, I only want the warning. Ah, public information. So you can always find stuff about hurricanes at our hurricane page. Uh, the banners are up right now all around the city. Cityofpsl.com slash hurricane um, or cityofpsl.com during a disaster. Our main front page, the, what they call the splash page, will have a banner across the top with the name of whatever the storm is, and it'll say click here for hurricane Ian information, I think is what it said last year when we had Ian. You click that, it takes you to a special place within the website that the communications department, who is the public information officer in our EOC, puts all the most up-to-date relevant information. If they, have, if they, for example, if we were to be handing out food and water, we got hit by a really bad one and we were setting up food and water stations for people all around the city, all of that would be on that page. You know location, what times it open, what times it closed, how much you can get, when you can get in line, um, you know, make sure to bring your ID so we can prove that you're a St. Lucie County resident because we don't want everybody from Miami coming and taking the food and water we bought for you. Um, <coughs> so uh, that, that kind of stuff will all be on that special page and they set that page up right before the storm comes on every storm and you'll see the banner across the top that say click here for hurricane whatever information. Uh, special needs registry. I think everybody in here looks good. I don't see anybody with an oxygen tank attached to them. But you may have family members who have to have electricity in order to survive, such as oxygen tanks, CPAP machines, um, so on and so forth. You should, you should get them to register for the special needs shelter. That way if they ever have to leave their home and go to a shelter, they can go to one that's going to have electricity so that those electrically dependent things that they're going to take with them will work. And it also is run by the Department of Public Health, so it has nurses there that can help with their issues while they're there until, they're, until we're able to clear their home and get them back to their home. You can get that at St. Lu there it is, stlucyco.gov slash special needs. That'll get you there. Or you can call the number there, 462-8100. All right, here are some websites of note, as well as my director, Billy Weinshank, and my name, and then there's our phone numbers, and there is our general email address. We always give this email address out instead of our individual one, because if you email that one, 
at the same time I get it, Billy gets it, and our uh, intern gets it. So three people get it at the same time, and then somebody will answer it. Whereas if you send it to me and I'm on vacation for a week and I just started, nobody's answering you until I come back from vacation because nobody knows you emailed me. <laughs> but uh, if you email that one, everybody gets it, so whoever's there can answer it. If you have any questions, you can do that. Uh, follow us on social media. There's the city's uh, social media things. And now it's fading. Oh, okay. The presentation today, if you, if you enjoyed the presentation, scan the QR code. Uh, you know how to do that with your phone. You just take a picture of it. It'll take you to our survey. Um, you can fill out the survey and say, you know, Shane was great. Uh, Bolivar wasn't. Um, <laughs> Um, or if I was really bad, don't fill out the survey. Um, that way I get all good grades. And, um, but no, we, we seriously, we do a survey so that we can make sure that we're getting through to our residents the stuff we want to get through to them. Did you understand it? Did I talk too fast? You know, uh, would you like more information? I think that's one of the questions. Is there something you would like more information on that we didn't have the time to dedicate to? And, uh, and then we'll reach back out to you once you complete the survey, as long as you put your contact information. If you don't put your contact information, we will not reach back out to you. Yeah, I promise, because we don't know how. Um, any questions? Well, Let's go ahead and take, uh, we have time for about two questions here. Does anyone have any questions for Shane or want him to clarify um, on anything that he spoke about um, before we um, conclude today? I'm sorry. Yeah, no you. worries. <laughs> you want a question? No? Oh, no, you're fine. I see one hand here. Anyone else other than this gentleman here afterwards? No? I'm not originally from Florida. When we first moved here and there was a hurricane, every TV station showed the... Uh, zone, the severity, uh, scared the hell out of me. And it turned out to be nothing. Recently, uh, I forget the name of the hurricane that missed us. Uh, Nicole, last November? Yeah, yeah it was kind of gorgeous and it hit. Right, the right. At what point in time do you accept what's on the news serious? When it says warning. <laughs> <laughs> the news meteor, I mean, I'm going to be honest for me, and I, I live down here in Florida, I've dealt with the hurricane. Uh, so I believe the news meteorologist to tell me that something might be coming. When it gets to the point where it looks like it's going to come to where I'm at, I follow local officials because they know. It may not be the meteorologist may not know. Um, you know, the local officials, if they tell you to evacuate, there's a reason why they told you to evacuate. It may not be the same reason you're seeing on local news because we talk directly to the National Hurricane Center multiple times a day. We had meetings with the National Hurricane Center, with the local National Weather Service office when there's something coming. They give us a little bit more insight as to not scare you to death. They give, they scare us to death instead. So they give us a lot more insight on, all right, they give us odds, you know, 57% right, chance it's gonna strike this city. You know, they will tell us those kind of odds that you'll never hear on TV to help us make decisions on whether we think evacuation is warranted. So if, we, if, if the evacuation order is given, there's a really good reason for it. Now the guys on TV, they're good to tell you, yeah, there's something out there, it's coming, you might want to go ahead and put your plan into effect, make sure you've got all your stuff from, go buy all the plywood at Lowe's. Um, but as far as telling me to evacuate, no, they're not going to tell you that. The local officials are going to tell you that. Now they will pass it on for us, because of course we, the communication people, tell all the news stations, and it should be on the priority you know, Evacuation is on in St. Lucie County. Evacuation is on me. It should be on the crawler going across when we make those decisions. Um, but then they also cover for us. They cover the press conferences where we speak about the update. You know, okay, we we, we ordered an evacuation is on A. It's on A. It's located here. We have a little pretty map printed out, set beside us. It's located here. If you live in that area, you need to evacuate now. Um, you know, the storm is going to be here in 20 hours and. 
So you really need to leave now because we know it's about a 27 hour clearance time from the time the evacuation is called for the number of people that live in the two zones, it takes 27 hours to get them to all leave. And the reason why is because not everybody leaves when you tell them to, right? <laughs> if we told everybody, okay, now it's the time to leave, and everybody said, they said it's the time to leave, but now some of them say, yeah, I'm still watching TV and they don't seem too concerned about it. I'm going to wait about three or four more hours to see what the next update looks like. Then the next update, oh, it, it's, a, it's one category higher and it's still heading toward us. Now I leave. That's why it takes 27 hours to clear everybody because a lot of people wait until the absolute last possible second to leave. <laughs> okay. The newer home thing that impacts last. Hold on one second. I'm going to give you the mic here. Um, when is the time? If they should they uh, leave, or is impact glass pretty safe for hurricanes like threes? Impact glass is made to withstand the impact of flying objects, so they're tested using I think it's a 12 foot, eight or 12 foot long two by four shot out of a cannon at 70 or 80 or 100 miles an hour, it's, and it's shot along the west, mm -hmm. so that it. That supposedly simulates like 150 mile an hour wind and something being thrown. 150? Something like 150. You have to look at the, it's the Texas Tech Center for Wind Science. So they, I mean, they've got all the videos where they test all these different things and the, uh, they, they, can, they can show you that on the web page what it's actually tested to. And whether it passed or not, you know, you may have a manufacturer that didn't pass their test but still selling the stuff. Does that happen? You know, <laughs> that would be the first time everybody being caught, somebody had been caught by a commercial enterprise. <laughs> um, but yeah, that happens. Sometimes they don't have wind certifications, but they still sell it and market it as impact glass. Um, if I had impact glass, I'm still going to put shutters over it. The reason being, yeah, impact glass costs fourteen hundred dollars for that window when I can buy a regular, you know, double pane window for three. I don't want it to break. I'm going to put a shutter over it, let it destroy the shutter. <laughs> And hopefully not destroy the mm. glass. But yes, if I'm flinching around with impact glass, my home's been built since 2003. You're right. New building code, then it, it, it should be able to withstand a category five wind. Yeah. A category five. It will not withstand the flood. It's, it's <laughs> not, the, the building code had nothing to do with floods. It had to do with wind events because of Hurricane Andrew. So remember that if you're, in a, if you're out on the river, I don't care if you are a Category 5 house. If they say that there's going to be a 12 foot storm surge, a Category 5 house is still going to flood just like a Category 1 house would. The windows still won't break. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, they will break. Yeah, the windows will break. It just doesn't wow. fly all the way through like a bullet goes through the body. It doesn't go all the way through it. It hits it and it flats it. But the windows still break. So it still get a hold of that. And if you get a hold of the window, what happens? It creates a vacuum when a hurricane goes over. So I think I saw one last hand raise. Final call. Did I miss somebody over here on this side? No? No? Okay. Just wanted to double check. <laughs> well, thank you, Shane. Can we give Shane a round of applause for the information? And we will go ahead and later tonight, I will um, upload these presentations to the, the, the Google Doc link that I sent you all. So you guys will have this information um, later tonight. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, everyone, so we are officially done for tonight. I just want to mention that for next week, we are going to be back at the City Hall Council Chambers. Um, regarding our speakers for next week, you will hear from the Neighborhood Services Department, which is actually is the, my department that I actually work for. So you'll get to hear from um, my team as well as myself. And also Office of Solid Waste will also be presenting for you all. And then we will have our Planning and Zoning Department as well. Those three um, departments will be leading the conversation next week. But thank you all again for being here tonight. And we do have food for you guys in the back if, for anyone that wants to take some leftovers um, home and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you all. Drive safely.